Chapter 6 It Runs in the Blood David was frozen, not moving a single muscle as if paralyzed by the voice. He clamped his hands down over his ears, trying desperately to drown out the voice which seemed to come from everywhere. Oh... Come now, David. That's no need to treat your friends. <laughs> friends, he responded in exasperation. Yes. <laughs> yes, David. I, I am your friend came another voice from the dark. A voice that only recently had stopped haunting David's every night. It was him, the Hatter. You. you! The Hatter stepped forward, a faint glow radiating from the holes of despair that the monster called eyes. Good to see you too, Davy boy. <laughs> the Hatter let out a cackle which sent a wave of ungodly feelings through David's body. A sharp, almost painful pressure suddenly gripped him as he stood before the monster, legs frozen, mouth agape, and eyes locked onto the spot where the figure stood. Words all but saved David in that moment, and instead... He felt like speech was something now completely foreign to him. His brain tried and tried, but his efforts were futile, finding no words to fill his mouth. Oh, what's wrong, <laughs> Purred the toothy beast, which floated silently above the hatter's head. Cat got your tongue. tongue. And at saying that, another deep chuckle escaped the foul creature's mouth. David stood there, overwhelmed by what he was seeing before him. For hours, it seemed, he had been frozen in place, stock still in the faces of these abhorred beings. And then finally, feeling reality slowly begin to come back to him, David was able to compose one single sound. It was one word. Impossible. It was impossible. Impossible! Impossible! But before David could stop himself from saying it, he found himself repeating the word over and over, as if his brain was a skipping record, allowing only that one word to leave his lips. Oh. Come now, Davy boy the Hatter. A devilish grin slowly spreading across his face. How? How could it be impossible? I'm standing right here. With saying that, the figure suddenly disappeared into a puff of smoke. David looked around frantically, attempting to locate the figure. Come now, David. I'm right in front of you. Can't you see? Chanted the voice. But David could hear the voice. And it was as if it circled all around him. Seemingly everywhere and nowhere, all at once. Oh, David. trailed the voice, and then David felt an ice-cold chill rush over him, because it now came from just behind his left ear. How I have missed you. David whipped around with a speed that surprised even him. Alas, much to the paranoid man's growing expectation, or rather lack thereof, 
There was nothing but the cold, dark, empty void accompanying him. David crumpled to the ground in a heap of utter fear and confusion. He began to weep, but not ten seconds later a light shone through the dark and a faint voice invaded him. Papa? came the voice of Alice. Alice? said David at the recognition of his daughter's voice. Papa! it called again. Alice! yelled David as he rose to his feet and dashed towards the light. He didn't care where it went, anywhere was better than here. David continued to follow the distant light along with the growing sound of his daughter's questing voice. David had nearly reached the source of the light when he heard another voice off in the distance. The voice made him stop in his tracks, for it was not a voice that he had ever heard before. It was hushed, almost non-existent, and yet David could hear the voice as clearly as if it were right next to him. It simply said, You should not have come back. David, she is in danger because of you. The words didn't seem to hit him instantly, instead only serving to confuse him even more. Only when it's too late <laughs> will poor David ever know the truth. David reached the end of the light and now he could see where it came from. A large decorative door now faced him, a blinding light, and the sound of his child's small but audible voice erupting from the open door. David walked through it, and all at once reality seemed to manifest itself again. David was back in the hospital room, still face to face with Alice, who simply smiled at her frightened father. <laughs> Papa? came the voice in front of him. Slightly startled from the experience, he went to reply to his daughter, who surely, after that, must have thought the man insane. So you can imagine David's confusion when the next thing that Alice said was simply, You saw them. Followed by a small giggle. David couldn't reply, not to that. But when she said that, David looked into her eyes, and in those few moments... David swore he saw something glimmer red in his daughter's eyes. Something that he knew all too well. The creatures which now haunted Alice were far from strangers to David. David feared for Alice, feared for himself. Hell, he feared for his very family. It was after the experience at the hospital that David was forced to face the truth of the beings. It was the Hatter that had long ago haunted David's own nightmares each and every night. Unknown to David, however, was exactly how these things had returned to him. More importantly, he needed to help Alice. He knew. He knew exactly what the beings would do, and it terrified him. He had to put a stop to Wonderland for good. In the goal of doing just that, David had enlisted the help of Dr. Carmine Richards, whom he had met in South Wales on business. Dr. Richard's work was known all throughout London at the time, as that was the origination of his practice, and soon all of Great Britain knew the great Carmine Richards. Carmine was said to have an uncanny ability for not only getting inside a patient's head, but also having the ability to wipe away certain obstacles in a patient's mind, as he put it. This is, in of itself, what was something virtually unheard of in the practices of medicine and science at the time, though Dr. Richards was a master psychologist with a PhD, he was really specialized, however, in a newer art, a more risky practice known as hypnosis. Hypnosis was not something most people at the time were familiar with, the poorer people calling the practice witchcraft or sorcery. Dr. Richard's patient's success rate was almost perfect due to this additional method, even if it meant that changing the minds of patients could have some particular side effects. In the wake of such an experience, it was nearly impossible for David to formulate coherent sentences. Still, his daughter stared into his eyes, as if trying to invade his very soul. Soon after this experience, David met with a well-renowned psychiatrist that he had met once while working on a trade harbor in South Wales. The man's name was Carmine Richards. And it was this man 
who would soon be met with a challenge so dangerous that it would soon put him and many others at risk. Well, but that, dear listener, <laughs> we will come back to.